Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, we now have our presenters in conference. Please be aware that each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. At the conclusion of today's presentation, we will open the floor for questions. At that time, instructions will be given if you would like to ask a question. I would like to now turn the conference over to Erin uh, Craig. Ms. Craig, you may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our educational webinar for ARC Safety Program for Ambulatory Surgery titled Cleaning, Disinfection, and Sterilization, a Deeper Dive. Participation in this conference call is by express written invitation of HRET only. Unauthorized participants and or any party that assists unauthorized participants may be subject to substantial criminal and civil penalties. If you have not been invited to take part in this call, please disconnect at this time. We are pleased to provide you with point I'm, I'm sorry, one CME CE used for today's webinar. The planners and faculty for ARC Safety Program for Ambulatory Surgery have indicated no relevant financial relationships to disclose in regard to the content of this activity. So with the new year, we also have a new platform that we're using. So welcome to the Adobe Connect platform. Like you all, the national program team here is also on a path of continuous improvement. So to meet to better meet the needs of our participating facilities and improve our webinar services, we will be transitioning to this new platform. We are confident that the features offered by Adobe Connect will enhance our interactive webinar events and provide a more robust experience for all of you. Before we start, I just want to quickly run through a couple of the features that uh, might be new to you. So we encourage you to use both the change your status and chat fe features. So to change your status within a meeting, you can do so by selecting uh, the status above to provide feedback to the presenters or other attendees. You can do so by clicking the arrow on the status option drop down, list on the application bar, and select your desired status option. If you select an option such as I agree or speed up or slow down, please note that your status will remain until you choose to clear it. This is also where you'll find the raise hand icon in this menu. So we will open up for a question and answer at the end of the webinar, but please feel free to let us know if you have a question or even let us know your question in that chat box area, which I will discuss next. So to chat, you can send a message to everyone simply by typing your message in the chat pod on the right-hand side of the webinar screen. You can hit enter or click the send icon. You can also send messages to specific attendees or groups within the meeting. And to do, you, to do this, use the attendees pod to hover over the name of the attendee you'd like to chat with and select Start Pirate Chat. With that said, I'd like to do our first interactive polling question here. So I want to know a little bit about yourself. Uh, so do you work in an ASC? And the polls are now open, so please feel free to select your votes as I speak. Are you represented by a management company today? And third, what is your professional background? And if there are multiple people at your center who are on the webinar, please check all that apply. Are you an administrator, an anesthesiologist or CRNA, a circulating nurse, an infection preventionist or control nurse, a member of the national program team, a scrub technician, surgeon, other technician, or other. And you can note that uh, you can actually see the, the results. So I see that a couple people are still voting. I want to give everybody a chance to register their vote. Great. It looks like voting has slowed, so we're going to move on. So on our last call, just to uh, before the new year and all the holidays, we reviewed the past practices of splash sterilization, and we explained the issues surrounding this practice. We talked about IUSS and discussed methods of reducing IUSS, and we also demonstrated the differences between gravity and dynamic air removal sterilizers. We also explained the required record keeping for these practices. So as some take home messages, we ask you to look at these records and understand what instruments undergoing IUSS and should be reviewed um, to see if there was any way that you could reduce IUSS at your center. 
We noted that it was always important to, to follow standards and the instructions for use. We looked at employee safety precautions must be adhered to when cleaning instrumentation, text processing instrumentation require training and competency, and quality monitoring are essential to assure that sterilization practices are efficacious. So with that said, I'd like to move on to today's presentation. It is my pleasure and honor to present today's presenter, Kim Delahanty, who is with us as the Administrative Director in Infection Prevention. Uh, she is with the UCSD Health System in the Clinical Epidemiology Unit. Kim, welcome and thank you from sunny San Diego. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, I want to thank HRET for this opportunity to be with all of you today, and I hope everyone's had a good beginning to their new year. Um, it's uh, exciting. I'm, I'm very excited to be with you all today to discuss the cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization a, a deeper dive, so let's get right to it. So the objectives today are to understand strategies related to cleaning, dis disinfection, and sterilization processes, to discuss how facilities determine whether their current processes are fulfilling the patient safety, infection control, regulatory needs in the field, to learn how to do a self-assessment checklist of actual practices and how they match up to industry evidence-based practices and how to learn the necessary skills. Numerous outbreaks have occurred in both the inpatient and outpatient settings due to breakdowns with disinfection and sterilization, and that is why this is such an important topic and to continue this conversation um, throughout the, the whole continuum of care. All invasive procedures with a medical device or instrument have contact with a patient's sterile tissue or mucous membranes are potentially at risk for having some kind of adverse outcome if we do not do cleaning and sterilization properly. Each year in the United States, it's estimated by the CDC that 46.5 million surgical procedures and 5 million gastrointestinal endoscopies are performed. That's a lot. And failure to follow adequate disinfection sterilization on any of these cases carries the risk of infection and transmission. It is important to mention the risks associated with the performance of surgical procedures outside the hospital or to traditional settings, as in the ambulatory surgery centers. Overall, the patients have less comorbidities, and so the risk of infection is less. This is changing as the number of invasive procedures performed in these settings is increasing. The setting and environment in which surgery is performed is critical to the prevention of infection both in hospitals and in settings outside the traditional OR. In centers where surgery is performed outside the hospital, several risks have been identified, and these risks, however, may also exist in a traditional setting. We need to insist that the same processes are followed no matter where surgery is being done for patient safety. Inadequate sterilization and disinfection processes pose a risk, especially outside the hospital where trained central service processing departments or personnel are not available or may not be trained adequately. So it's important to have proper environment, proper cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization, that the staff are trained adequately, that you don't have antiquated equipment, borrowed equipment, improper use of equipment, or compromised cleaning procedures. So in the process section, in order to ensure quality care, processes must be compliant with standards, guidelines, and recommendations. Uh, listed here are Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Association of Operating Room Nurses, but there's also others, APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Prevention, and epidemiology. Dr. Rutala has a website on disinfection sterilization. We also have the AMI Standard 79 Steam Sterilization, ST79, which was released on, uh, a revision of it was released on January of 2014. These are all standards, guidelines, and recommendations anyone in an ambulatory surgery center should be familiar with and actually have at the ready to make sure that we're following all of the guidelines. We need to be standardized. So all are doing the same and the right thing every time. We know and we look at historically, when we standardize processes, the outcomes for patient safety improve. We need to include competency evaluations for the staff and monitor those compliances. So not only do we Im implement, but we have to constantly do the shoe leather surveillance and going around and watching. What we think oftentimes is happening 
is not always happening. So we have to get out of our offices if we're in that in that level of managing or monitoring compliance and actually watch the process. CMS also requires facilities to select and follow standards, guidelines, and recommendations from governmental and professional groups, as well as manufacturers' instructions for use. That's what we call an IFU, instructions for use. Sometimes they don't meet the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, or ARN, Association of Operating Room Nurses, standards for safe and effective processing. You need to contact the company and other facilities to see what they're doing. Bug the manufacturer to produce better in, um, um, instructions for use, IFUs. Look at these before you buy. Make sure that you're looking at the whole process so that you can um, be certain that you've done your due diligence to make sure you're buying the, the safest piece of equipment. Some instruments are very difficult to impos or impossible to clean successfully, such as arthroscopic shavers. These have caused outbreaks and have been seen in the literature to do that. So investigation reveal uh, much debris even when the IFUs were followed. So you have to look at the actual um, device itself and the less crevices, the less moving parts, the less ridges, the safer the piece of equipment. That's not always um, applicable for the procedure and so we understand that, but the, the least amount of, of um, non-straight uh, surfaces is the best when we can do that. You need to read in full the IFUs and share with staff and quiz them. And as your equipment changes, you need to make sure you update your IFUs, instructions for use. Be sure you have the current version. And sometimes, again, like I said, there's conflict. So you have to work with the manufacturer and with the recommendations from the professional organizations to try to come to some consensus on what's the safest practice. So diving down a little bit more on manufacturer's instruction for use, they have processes in place to ensure most current IFU version for each piece of equipment and instrument, accessible to staff that's using it and cleaning it, that it's being followed. It's, a lot of this is monitoring and uh, making sure that you're watching the actual process. Not just having them take a quiz, but actually going through and taking the rigor to go through each step of the process. This includes your required maintenance, calibration, and you want to make sure that you're keeping your records and your logs, because they will ask you that. So some of the factors uh, influencing this disinfection and sterilization is the cleaning of the object, organic and inorganic load present, type and level of microbial contamination, the concentration of an exposure time to disinfectant and the sterilant, the nature of the object, like we discussed, is they have a lot of nooks and crannies, movable parts, removable parts uh, for uh, scopes, other channels, temperature and relative humidity, improper packaging or overloading the sterilizer chamber can form air pockets that prohibit items from being sterilized, and I think that was discussed in the last webinar. So cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization are complex processes made even more complex by the wide variation in the types of instruments and equipment being processed. The materials they are made of, the different chemicals on the market, and the resources available for this process and the skill and knowledge of those doing the work. So it makes it very difficult to manage that if we don't have standardized processes in place. When the CDS IFU is inadequate or wrong, so sometimes the IFU is inconsistent with good cleaning, disinfection, sterilization practices based on the science and evidence through those regulatory and uh, professional organizations I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, again, arthroscopic shaver is still dirty after cleaning following the IFU US probe disinfection. So what happens is the IFU says, this is the situation, here's how you clean it. Even after cleaning that, what happened is these shavers still had bio burden on them. And um, it was because they were asking them to use this pop-up wipe uh, and they were not effective for getting that biofilm off. The scope manufacturer recommended cleaning with the Hivaclans, which is an antiseptic for use on skin, not on instruments. So again, you have to use your scientific um, knowledge base and reach out to your infection prevention colleagues and your infectious disease colleagues to help with uh, certain situations that may not be appropriate for the actual cleaning and disinfection of equipment. 
Another use is a manufacturer recommends a specific brand of a product, and this can lead to needing many brands of essentially the same product. So you don't want to go by brand as, you, as much as you want to go by the chemical makeup of what that is. If it's an enzymatic cleaner and it meets all of the FDA approval and TFM for an enzymatic cleaner, it doesn't matter if it's enzymatic cleaner A or B, but oftentimes um, vendors will say, well, you can only use this product with my piece of equipment. And when you drill down, it, 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 it's not the case. So make sure you clarify those conflicts and contact the manufacturer. Standardization. Processes uh, for pretty much everything must be standardized. We've learned this over and over for quality improvement and patient safety. And so everyone is doing the same thing the same way, um, whether it's putting in a central line, whether it's doing cleaning and disinfection, whether it's doing a, a skin prep for a procedure. The instrument and the scoping processing is if I am competent on one scope, can I do them all? No. Every scope or piece of instrument that's new, there has to be a competency for each individual one. Even though, say, for instance, and I am not um, 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 a proponent of any product, I'm just saying that, say it's Olympus and there's three different Olympus scopes, every scope that's different has to have a competency for cleaning and uh, high-level disinfecting that scope. One of the side benefits of this is that patients experience consistent care and the message they get are the same from each staff member. So making sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, use of various pieces of equipment are also uh, need to be standardized. So making sure that each piece of equipment is being used for the right reason, for the right procedure. Just to give you an example, we had um, in our ultrasound, we had badge probes and the badge probes were being put in this little crocheted holder that one of the nurses did as a to keep it warm for the patient and and you know the intention is really nice unfortunately that crocheted little um, pouch actually harbored bacteria as you can imagine was never clean and was not the appropriate piece of equipment to store the vag probes after they were high level disinfected as an example we want to make sure that the cleaning of the environment is consistent and standardized and that the isolation practices are as well. What you want to watch out for is staff may know and understand the right way, but lack of staff and time forces them to deviate from the standard, putting patients at risk. It's not that the staff don't want to do the right thing. I don't think people come to work saying, well, I want to harm someone. They want to come and do the right thing. Oftentimes, we, unfortunately, administration and facilities and how we are um, architecturally designed cause problems for them to do the right thing. They just don't have the resources to do it correctly, or maybe they didn't get the training as well. So we have to make sure we, we give them all of the good tools uh, in order to do the right thing. As an example, not soaking scopes for full time required, not inspecting it carefully that the items are totally clean, uh, using single dose vials as multi dose vials, or reusing syringes are examples of cutting corners where there could be risk and have been outbreaks associated with these uh, corners being cut. The workarounds can indicate a process failure and be dangerous. The shortcuts can cause patient safety, can also cause employee harm as, as well. If we're not using the chemicals and the uh, equipment appropriately, employees and staff can get harmed as well. The lack of staffing and time constraints can, to, can lead to both of these. If there's quick turnaround and you've got a physician who, you know, just wants to do everything every 15 minutes, that can be challenging if you are limited with the supply of your instruments or scopes and you need to go through the full process to make sure that it's safe for the next patient. And then again, doing root cause analysis to try and find out what the issues are. Uh, we say this over and over again, lack of instrumentation is not uh, appropriate reason for uh, flash sterilizing or intermediate use steam sterilization or not going through the scope process to its full extent. Those are not appropriate reasons for having those, um, those corners cut. When we look at monitoring practices, we want to see what gets measured and can we be can it be improved. So you oftentimes want to look at high volume, high risk when you look at things that need to, or anything that might be trending in the wrong direction that is a concern for the healthcare providers, the surgeons, 
um, the nursing staff, etc. Staff need to know that they will be held accountable, that their manager and you care about what they're doing, and that it must be done per the standard, and that that standard of care is what is going to save patients, and that it is very important that they follow those. All practices need monitoring, and this means you have to know what the right way is. So, um, for example, the management staff in my ambulatory surgery centers, they don't do the actual high-level disinfection or the sterilization decom, but they've gone through the actual training in order to understand what it is they need to do. So when they're monitoring the process, they know what steps it takes, and then that way they can see whether there's any breaches or gaps. It also helps to give the staff and the management team a, a more cohesive um, relationship that there isn't, that everyone understands what the issues are, if there are any, and also understands the complexity of what they're doing and appreciates the work that they're doing. I just want to reiterate on the Spalding classification at this time here for medical devices, and, and not just as a review, in 1972, Dr. Earl Spalding developed a system for classifying medical instrumentation and equipment. And remember, surgeons don't get a class on sterilization and high-level disinfection and cleaning and, and, and all of that. And, and it's not their job, and it's our role to make sure that they understand where the science and evidence came in order for us to have to do these standardized processes in a very um, focused way in order to prevent any harm. They oftentimes, once you sit down with them and, and talk to them and have that conversation with them in that way, they, go, they have an aha moment. It's not that you're trying to stop their productivity. Uh, it is that you are really trying to make sure everybody's safe. So Dr. Spaulding developed non-critical, which is devices that touch intact skin, environmental surfaces, and that's a low level of disinfection. Semi-critical, so that's something like your blood pressure cuff, your, you know, uh, surfaces at your nurse's station, et cetera. Semi-critical devices in contact with intact mucous membranes or skin, that is not intact. So that's a high-level disinfection, and that's kind of like your endoscope. Um, that would be an example of semi-critical. And critical is high-risk devices enter sterile tissue or the bloodstream, and they all need to be sterilized. Examples of the critical uh, would be your surgical instruments. Again, oftentimes in ambulatory surgery centers, and I, I do uh, across the country for APIC, I talk on, to ambulatory surgery centers on infection prevention, and a lot of medical, medical specialty clinics will say, well, we don't, we're not an ASC. And then you drill down, and they have dental in, within them, and they're doing oral surgery, uh, they're doing um, podiatry, and they end up uh, doing an ingrown toenail that ends up having blood on the uh, clipper, well, that at that point then needs to be sterilized. It just can't be uh, high-level disinfected. So, again, there's a lot of mixing, um, and as we grow out more and more from the hospital and out into these ambulatory outpatient areas, we see more and more of this kind of uh, blurring of what the standards are. So we have to make sure that we are sticking to the standards regardless of where the patient's having the procedure. Another, to uh, go even further into Spalding, is that, um, and there's, these tables are listed, and we can get these to you as well, but they're listed in the APIC text, and you can also go online and get them. Uh, it, it's a nice table that shows device classification and what examples of those devices are and Spalding process classification, what you can use on them, and then the EPA product classification. So that's one of the tools you probably want to have in your back pocket if you're doing any of these cleaning, disinfection, or high-level disinfection in your facility. If you're unsure what the category or item falls into, play it safe and go up a level. That's just error on the side of caution. Some areas may find it more cost-effective and less cumbersome to use a tabletop sterilizer or non-lumen instruments than need high-level disinfection. Uh, they, that they fall under the high-level disinfection, but it might be more frugal for that area to actually do the, the steam sterilization because there's so much in high-level disinfection and competencies and the chemical and air exchanges, et cetera. So, again, it's just a balancing of what works best for you all. You can never go down, but you can always do more uh, when you talk about high-level disinfection versus sterilization. Okay, instrument scope processing. Does your process permit instruments or scopes to have debris dry on them before processing. That is um, a practice we 
try to avoid, and the reason for that is a bio burden, once it starts to accumulate on a piece of equipment, it's really difficult to get it off. And if there's any biofilm or any bio burden on any piece of equipment, it cannot be sterilized because the sterilizer cannot get through that biofilm. So use of an enzymatic detergent spray or soap to prevent this is what we recommend. And uh, there's now this really cool foam that you can even put on if you're not able to get to the piece of equipment right away to do the full decon and high-level disinfection. You can spray it, and it, at least it stays uh, moist, and it has the enzymatic cleaner that breaks down that prote proteinaceous uh, material on it. And it has to uh, be an enzymatic detergent disinfectant to render items safe from bloodborne pathogens for handling, and that's the purpose for doing that. Hinged instruments can go through instrument washer and still have blood in the hinges, so that's another reason why this enzymatic cleaning is so important. And it must be physically taken apart and scrubbed. Otherwise, the hinge will be open during surgery and dry flakes of organic material may fall out into the sterile field, and we've seen that happen. We've had uh, unusual occurrence reports on the, this specific issue. Forceps also, or clamps, uh, must be open, and they have those nice little ridges, so it's really important to do that pre-clean and scrub through all of the little nooks and crannies. The, some instruments may have to be totally taken apart during the cleaning procedure. The lumens in the channels have to be irrigated or cleaned by suction. And many instruments require manual cleaning. Some, like ophthalmology instruments, cannot go through an automatic system. So just know what you're, what you're dealing with and make sure you have the right process. The soiled instruments may harbor the bacteria and the viruses in that biofilm, so that's why it's really important that we get rid of all of that and we don't transmit them that to the next patient. And these are all on pieces of equipment, again, that are our designated and FDA approval for multi-use. Single use, you just discard after that patient. All right. To further uh, go on to instrument processing, we have sterile packs uh, where instruments have debris on them and are not sterile and must be reprocessed or not used. So if that, that's why we have all the different checks when you have the sterile packs to make sure that uh, the first person looks at it and looks to see if it meets the requirements on the uh, the uh, integrator, and then the next person when they open it at the at the so the OR nurse or the scrub tech is opening up the um, packet. They look to see that that actual indicator is correct, and it shows that it went through the process. And you just keep that. There's three checks usually on each sterile pack, and by that third check, we should know that it is either it is either ready and you can use it in a sterile field or it's not. So we need to take that time to make sure that we look at all of those things. The um, internal indicator I just talked about, you have to check if it fails or if it's reprocessable, if it shows that it meets that requirement. And what we do is we put all the indicators and integrators, because there's two, on a storyboard and we have that up in the sterile processing department so that you can see what is a positive and what is a negative, what is fail and what is um, appropriate. And then the staff need to know that it's okay to say, I'm sorry, but this doesn't meet that, even if it's at the sterile field, because that's going to save the patient from having any adverse outcomes. And also, do you know who receives these reports and takes corrective action, monitors and follows up to ensure it's fixed? So once the staff report it, to whom do they report it, and how is that getting um, the loop closed so that we make sure it doesn't happen again, or there's a process in place to help make sure that doesn't happen again? Again, all of these issues should be reported up to your infection control committee, whether that's through QAPI, your board of directors, and put in some type of minutes, because regulatory agencies will come in and ask for those types of issues. The scope processes. Um, I know you guys have had, or if you've attended the other webinars, we've gone into detail, so we're just going to do a quick review on here on the scope processes. But the leak test is immediately before cleaning, and if there's any problem with leak testing, meaning that the water's coming out through any liver or hole in the scope, it's taken offline immediately and sent back to the manufacturer. If it fails, um, process for completing disinfection, then you tag it 
and you segregate that for repairs. So you want to make sure that you do at least a pre-clean and the enzymatic cleaning so that the people getting it at the manufacturer plant are not being exposed to the blood or body fluid or the bio burden. So that's the purpose for doing that um, first econ. Inspect for cleanliness before soaking. Uh, the process for recleaning is indicated. So if you still see some biofilm, then it needs to soak in the enzymatic cleaner. Again, remembering to follow manufacturer's guidelines on what the, the dilution is to your enzymatic cleaner and for how long. And that will help with the solution tested for the potency. You also have test strips that you have to do for quality control per your manufacturer. So based on what product you're using, make sure you're the right test strips for that product and you're doing the quality controls as well as the monitoring of the efficacy of the solution. And monitoring staff for compliance with all of these. And these also have to have logs associated with them. Um, it's really important to understand that document training of each individual who will be cleaning and disinfecting scopes and other equipment is important. That you post a detailed cleaning procedure above the sink to help them. These are things that we can do to help them be successful. Personal protective equipment must be worn, full resistant gown, gloves, face, eye protection. Um, you need to have annual competencies, evaluation by someone who understands the process. Also, if procedures change, that they're acquiring new scopes or different scopes, that you go through that competency. It might not be annual. It might be like within the six months because you've changed out your equipment. And this has to be documented in their personnel file. Periodically observe to ensure procedures are being followed. If transmission via scope is suspected, you can aspirate sterile water into a sterile cup and send it to the lab to see if the organism found in the patient is also found in the scope. This you want to engage your infection control partners and make sure that you're doing this in collaboration. I wouldn't say to do this just off the cuff and go out and do environmental culturing. This is, has a lot of implications and you have to do it correctly and have to make sure you're sending it to a lab who can do environmental testing. So this is just one of the things you could do in the event there was transmission suspected. But that would be a collaborative working group with your infection prevention, your infectious disease, your board of directors, your surgeon, and your staff. Routine preventive maintenance of scopes and scope washers, et cetera, has to happen. And you have to log out that with a biomed company. Uh, maybe the manufacturer provides that for you, but there has to be some process in place. And uh, again, a second reference is Dr. Rutala's disinfection and sterilization.org competency checklist for scope processing. He has a beautiful website on all types of disinfection, sterilization, high level disinfection, checklist, policy and procedure templates, all of that. And that's uh, disinfection and sterilization.org. Dr. Rutala is spelled R U T A L A. Okay. Now we're going to go on to a quick quiz. Surveyors are looking for evidence of monitoring temperature and humidity in ORs and central service instrument processing areas. True or false? And Kim, that poll is now open, so please participants uh, feel free to register your vote. Great. See everybody's voting. Looks good. We've got about 50% of people voted, and everybody voted correctly. The answer is true. Um, and they are not only looking for um, monitoring temperature and humidity, they're also looking at the um, pressure, positive and negative pressures. So I'm going to go into that a little bit uh, after this second question here. So um, I think we can move to the second question. According to ARN, all staff hair must be covered in the OR. The poll is open. Everybody's giving their answer. So far, so good. All right. Looks like we have yep. everybody voted. Everybody voted. We have one person who said um, false. Everybody else uh, was correct and in true. And that's to include facial hair as well. Um, everything has to be covered. And so what we do with the little skull caps is we uh, require that the bouffant goes over that as well because the skull cap really doesn't cover a lot of the 
the facial hair, the sideburns of the of the men. So that's kind of how we've gotten around that. But I want to go a little bit into detail about the sterilizers. Not only are they looking for monitoring temperature and humidity in the ORs, they're also looking for making sure that you are in the right pressure. So a decon area where you're doing your decontamination of your instruments, whether it's um, for sterilization or high-level disinfection, must be a negative pressure. Uh, to remember this, I always say dirty bugs stay in, so negative pressure is in, and that way it doesn't go out into the ambient air. The sterilizers, uh, where your sterilizers are, are positive pressure, must be 0.2 or greater for positive pressure, and these keep the dirty bugs out. So once they come out of the sterilizer, they're in a positive pressure environment, and then that way there's less risk of contamination of the environment. Your humidity ranges need to be between 20 and 60%. The higher uh, the humidity is more of an infection control issue, the lower the humidity is more of a fire risk. So it's a blended reason why you have to monitor your um, humidity. All right, on to the next. So checklists, checklists, checklists. There's lots of checklists. If you already have a checklist and you feel you're meeting all the needs and when you've gone to these webinars you say, yes, I'm identifying all of these issues, then you don't need to go back and use another checklist. Stay with the same. If you've had surveys and, and they've said this is right on point, then you're great. But if you need help or you don't feel like you're meeting all of the standards and recommendations, then like I said, Dr. Rutala's website is a, a great website to go on. Um, the APIC has Ambulatory Surgery Center Toolkit. It has checklists and template policies and procedures. There's lots of resources out there for you to help you with that. The checklists are, um, with the checklist you can delete portions that aren't applicable also, so make sure you tailor make it. And uh, we say steal shamelessly in the epi world because we all uh, have a lot to do, as I'm sure all of you do. And so we, um, we do share a lot of documents and a lot of policies and procedures. Just remember to change your name. And so that doesn't say, you know, hospital A when you're actually hospital C. Oftentimes uh, the surveyors will go through the policy and they'll say, well, wait a minute, you're not hospital A, you're hospital C because we forgot to, you know, we cut and paste and we forgot to change the name. So that's just a word of the wise. Um, and if you don't do scopes, for example, don't put scopes in the, you know, don't have a checklist for scopes. You don't need to use that or, or worry about that. They can assist in standardization and compliance, and, and we've seen that happen. They are especially helpful for complex, multi-step processes, which sterilization and high-level disinfection are, such as um, the uh, instrument, again, and the scopes, what type of scope and what type of instruments you're cleaning. This helps to keep that um, on task and that you are actually going through every step that's necessary. It also helps to take uh, to be taken in order so that you don't go out of order. And, and sometimes when we go by memory, we either forget a step or we go out of order. And the reason why there is an order is because it is specific to getting rid of the bio burden, the biofilm, and making sure that it's a dirty to clean process. Some may not be applicable, like I said, and you can tailor your facility as long as its essential steps aren't removed and you're following the regulation and the manufacturer guidelines and the instructions for use and all the regulatory requirements, uh, triple AHC, whatever it is that your regulatory um, facility, the regulatory agency your facility has. Also, you must incorporate and follow requirements and best practices, so using your professional organizations, your infection prevention partners, the uh, resources online, and guide practice, ensuring steps aren't missed and tasks are done correctly and in the correct order. Monitoring of performance is still required, and the checklist is just a piece of paper, so you still have to visually go and watch and make sure. Look at your logs, look at your checklist, but also I can't reiterate that enough to get out there and actually watch it on the, uh, and do it inconsist uh, not inconsistently, do it in a manner which they don't know that you're going to be there. Uh, different times of the day, maybe in the evening, early morning, um, switch it up. It's, it's a good practice to do. And then checklists can be used to monitor performance as well. Okay, so now we've got some uh, pictures. Um, what's wrong with this picture or what might be helpful about this picture. And you can see a lot by looking at your record keeping. 
For example, in this, um, you want to stress the importance of consistently documenting your results, making sure that you do your QCs as well as your monitoring, and that, in addition, regulatory agencies will review these logs for completeness, and the logs should be monitored to ensure that machines are functioning. Reports uh, should be made to the Infection Control Committee, uh, also your biomed teams, so if there is a machine that's not working properly and you've tried, uh, uh, you've done a redo of your QC, then that needs to be taken offline until biomed can come and make sure it's uh, working correctly or maybe it needs to be taken offline so they can fix it. And note that the control on the log sheet is always positive. This is a picture we like to show to say just, you know, you don't have to answer, but it's kind of like where's Waldo? Is this acceptable? Is it acceptable in a clinical space to have the mixing of all of these different items? And one of the things that brings my, my eye to is the personal items that are in with the test strips, the cleaning wipes, the hand lotion, a test tube, it looks like they're a, a graduated cylinder. So um, it's not okay to have it, this mixture. Even in an ambulatory care center where you may not be dealing with as sick uh, patients or infectious patients, but sometimes we don't know until after. So the hand lotion there on the bottom shelf along with the hull cough drops should not be in with the ibuprofen, I'm guessing, or, or some kind of uh, over-the-counter medication. And then you look at the second shelf, you see the gum and some kind of personal spray. All these things, uh, you have to have a space for personal items and staff items and then a space for your actual work uh, items. And you shouldn't have your administrative, like a stapler and all of that, mixed in with the cleaning and the uh, test stripping and all of the things that you're going to use with patients or on patient equipment. Okay. So much to fix, so little time. So this is a scope cabinet, and um, what's wrong with this is that the scopes have to be free hanging, not touching anything, not the scope cabinet, not each individual scope, and should not have any sheaths on them because this plastic sheath that you see here, they were trying to do the right thing, but unfortunately that causes moisture. With moisture, what happens with moisture and heat, bacteria or microorganisms grow. So it should be in a well-ventilated cabinet, not jammed up. There should be nothing on the bottom. Well-ventilated, closed cabinet where all scopes are hanging totally straight down and all movable parts are removed and put on a shelf separate and so that they're allowed to dry effectively. All these loops and things pose a problem in the event there was liquid or fluid still left in the chamber, which there shouldn't be, but sometimes we all know that things don't happen like we think they do. And that's how um, transmission of organisms and people get sick occur. Okay, sorry, a little. All right, um, this is an example of an expired 90 days after opening 917. When do they expire? So the date it was open were, it looks like 917, and then that they expire on 12. 17, that is greater than 90 days. Oh, actually, no, this is, this is actually correct. I apologize. So, um, see the manufacturer date up there, it says 12-5-2013. That's what the issue is here, that this is saying from 9-7, to 12-17, which is 90 days. However, the manufacturer is saying this bottle is only good till 12-5, and they let it stay out till 12-17. So not only do you have to look at the 90 day, but you also have to look at the manufacturer date on it to make sure you don't extend that. Sorry about that. And then again, this is an example. So the scopes are hanging perfectly, except for the one, the second one in is touching itself. But the real issue is, that we had with this is that there shouldn't be any liquid at the bottom. If there's this brownish liquid at the bottom, I'm concerned that we're not cleaning our scopes appropriately and this water is coming from the scopes once we hang it, which tells me that 
we may not have been cleaning scopes as effectively. So a lot of things can tell you, lead you to where you can focus, where you might think you have issues by just walking around and opening up cabinets and looking at things. It may not be an issue, but again, that would cause me alarm. So I, I really thank you for your attention, and uh, some of the take-home messages are to take steps to standardize your processes to ensure quality patient care, considering utilizing a checklist to increase compliance with standards, guidelines, and recommendations. Also to start monitoring your processes if you haven't already, uh, look for workarounds and see if they're occurring, and do root cause, uh, root cause analysis to determine that. Also, staff should know the current recommended guidelines and utilize them when developing, reviewing, and revising related policies and procedures. And some of those guidelines come from, as a review, the AMI SP79, the APIC ASC Toolkit, Dr. Rutala's um, website, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the HICPAC guidelines, uh, the Association of Operating Room Nurses, and uh, also CMS. And one of the things that we learned that was helpful for us was taking pictures. So I recommend that you do take pictures because oftentimes staff are very busy and overwhelmed and we have a lot of throughput and we forget and when you show a picture, they have an aha moment at that point. Not to point fingers, but just to show an example. So I thank you for your time and attention and I'll uh, hand it back over to Erin. Thank you, Kim, for such a wonderful presentation. I have a, just a couple housekeeping slides before we get into the question and answer and I encourage you to Think of some questions that you might already have and put those in the chat box because obviously we can see through Kim's presentation that she has a wealth of knowledge that uh, we would love to hear your questions so that she can share that with you. So just some additional training and how to get help. Remember our website always has tons of resources and is available for you at ASCSafetyProgram.org. If you ever have any data collection questions or CDS questions, we encourage you to contact us at hretdatasupport at aha.org and with any clinical or program-related questions at our ASC Safety Program email. As many of you have probably already heard from Jeff and Emily, we still want to remind you that these are our quality improvement advisors that are here to help you and their contact information is included here. Our next event, we will start our checklist series and with um, communication and teamwork strategies. So with that said, that will be February 11th, and we will be talking about how you can build culture in your center. So this is just a reminder that we are offering CEUs and CMEs for today's event. As previously uh, in the past webinars, we will still email you after today's session to the link with, the serv with pardon me, the link to the survey. Alternatively, you can also access the survey by following the link that's on this slide or immediately following the question and answer period. The Adobe Connect platform will actually send you a direct link to the survey. Now, I also wanted to mention too, when you receive this email communication from us after today's event, not only will it include this survey link, but I know that Kim mentioned multiple resources during the webinar, and we want to make sure that we get those out to you, so we'll include links to those in that communication as well. So with that said, um, I'd like the operator now to open us up for question and answer so that you guys can, can hear from us. Thank you, Erin. At this time, we will open the floor for questions. If you would like to ask a question, please press the star key followed by the one key on your touchtone phone now. Questions will be taken in the order which they are received. If at any time you would like to remove yourself from the question queue, please press star 2. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 now. There are currently no questions. I, I believe that um, Mark Mayo has a question in the chat box, and he said, can Kim please repeat Dr. Rutella's website info? Sure. It's um, all one word, disinfection and sterilization.org. 
And if you uh, Google uh, Rutala, R-U-T-A-L-A, it comes right up as well, and a lot of all of his other um, tools, I would say, will come up there as well. Great. Thank you, Kim. And, and also, Mark, we will try to include that in the email communication that you receive from us so that you can easily reference that as well. Oh, and it looks like thank you, Evan, for including that link in the chat box. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 now. And there are no questions at this time. Hey. Well, we encourage you that if you think of any questions for Kim after today's session, she is um, available through email, so you can email us and we can get to her and make sure that we get your questions answered. Again, we thank Kim for an excellent presentation today and the effort that she put in, and also we thank you, you all for your participation. So uh, we look forward to seeing you next time, and this concludes today's webinar.